Welcome to Doc Talk, where complex medical topics become easy conversations with me, Dr. John Martin, and me, Dr. Brianna Walton. So come on over to AAMC and get a dose of the doc. seen each other in a while. Yeah, it's been two months. Welcome everyone. My name is uh, Dr. John Martin. I am actually a vascular surgeon and I'm the director of heart and vascular services here at Anne Arundel Medical Center. And I'm really happy actually to see a full crowd tonight. In fact, we, we almost have to add some more seats. I'm pretty thrilled tonight because I've been kind of lonely the last couple months. My co-star has been away <laughs> and last month she was away in Rwanda. And so I, I'm going to ask her to share a little bit of her story so all of you can be as proud of her as certainly I am. So well, give us a little bit about your experiences in Rwanda. Well, I've been gone for two weeks for a trip to Rwanda. I go every year. Um, it's simply amazing to go to a country who's gone through such a significant tragedy. I'm sure most of you have heard about the Rwandan genocide in 1994. But our group is uh, about 22 people who consist of nurses and doctors as well as physicians or uh, surgeons and anesthesiologists. And essentially, we provide care for women who have urogynecologic problems, specifically fistula. And a lot of those patients are victims of the genocide. So our group, over that 10-day to 12-day period, saw about 125 people wow. and operated on a significant number. So it was a busy time, but it was very fulfilling. And it's something I like to stay involved in. So thank you for letting me go. <laughs> I gave her up a little bit. <laughs> the sacrifices you have to make for mankind, right? That's right. Well, I'm glad to have your back because we have a lot to cover tonight. Tonight we're going to talk about uh, osteoarthritis, arthritis, and joint replacements, both hip and knee. Now, a quick question for the audience. Hmm? Did you know that 50 million people in the United States are actually affected by arthritis? Huge number. 27 million of those actually involve osteoarthritis, and about a million and a half people have rheumatoid arthritis. And over the course of the year, about 3 million people actually suffer knee injury. I was kind of expecting when they came up the stairs. Yes, right. Huge numbers. We well, see it in where the high heels this time, right? Yeah, I've learned. How many of you have actually walked behind a woman wearing high heels? We watch their ankles. It's actually a miracle we don't have 6 million knee injuries. That's right. Year. That's right. Well, many of you are familiar with the term osteoarthritis. It's probably one of the most common types of arthritis, and it usually begins with pain and stiffness in a joint. So arthritis, which is really just a wearing away of the smooth joint, usually presents with stiffness and pain, primarily because of bone-on-bone -bone contact. So tonight we're going to take some time to talk about this. I have a question for the audience. First of all, I've got a couple. I'd like to get you guys involved. Yes. How many of you have actually had a joint replacement? Raise your hands. OK, let's take this right. How many of you haven't had a joint replacement? <laughs> Okay, so we got a few people that are, is this the pre-op clinic? Is that what I'm looking at here? <laughs> Joy. Right, so I'll start with the pre-op talk, Dr. Broussard. We can start here. All right, I got a question for you. Now, this is your trivia question. If you get this wrong, you all have to leave. Which came first? The first hip replacement or the start of World War II? How many vote for World War II? You have to leave. <laughs> Actually, the first hip replacement actually predated World War II. It first happened and actually in 1940. It's kind of amazing. It's been around for a while. Incredible mm -hmm. number of evolutions, and now we've gotten to the point with hip replacement, over a quarter of a million people every single year get hip replacement. That's why the orthopedic surgeons who do joints have such big houses. <laughs> Just kidding. I, I didn't say that. I didn't say that. All parties excuse it. <laughs> The, the, the problem, best. obviously, is <laughs> osteoarthritis is a degenerative condition. There's really no cure for it. And actually, joint replacement, fabulous operation, it changes the life, changes people's life. And unfortunately, there's a lot of people, and our goal here tonight is to change that, who are afraid of surgery and don't have it, and therefore make tremendous changes in what they do in their day-to-day -day life to work around the pain that they have from arthritis. You know, what's funny, John, is that usually when we do these shows, we talk about how women are always on top of things and they get their job done first. 
It's not the same for osteoarthritis or hip replacement. Are we going to win one, finally? You're going to finally All season long, I've been losing. Yeah. I'm going to finally have my night. So women generally don't go to the physician right away for hip pain. They, they just deal with it, which is an unfortunate reality. In fact, one of the most recent studies that was published basically said that women are three times more likely to have pain, but less likely to have hip surgery, which I couldn't believe that statistic. I mean, it's actually astronomical that we would sit and deal with pain when we don't have to. In that study that compared women's experiences with men's, men's experience in hip pain, they also looked at other significant factors. We tend to rate our pain higher, 10 out of 10. We usually have a lot more trouble with sleeping. We usually choose it to, to basically improve our range of motion and so we can basically get a better night's sleep. Unfortunately, women also tend to take more medications. It's not always a solution to the problem. And they end up saying, okay, I'm not gonna do it. I'm gonna see a chiropractor or an acupuncturist, which is not necessarily the right thing to do. So. Interesting. You know, how many of you actually were at the show uh, last month? Actually, we've got a lot of new people here. That's actually pretty good. Well, there was well if you were here great. last month, you learned a lot about how men actually don't go to the doctor. And it, it's kind of interesting, actually, that this is one of those situations where the statistics are different. Now, mm -hmm. I've actually done a fair, I do a lot of research before every one of these shows to try to come up with some witty things. And this one didn't take me very long. I understand why men go to the doctor quicker for this one, because we're wimps, right? You deliver babies. You know what pain is like, and you can deal with it. Men, we're all sissies. The biggest guy is complaining of pain in the hospital every single time, and actually, I'm sure Mark and our experts will tell us, you get up on the joint floor in a replacement, who complains the most about post-operative pain? Mm -hmm. It ain't the ladies, it's the men. So that's actually one of the issues as to why I think men run to the doctor to get their new joints. I could say that we want to be athletic and all those other things, but I think the fact of the matter is we're really wimps. I'd like to introduce you now with a little story, uh, a lady who actually has taken the bull by the horns and, and made that step to yes. change your life. I want you to meet Deborah. Can we play the tape now? My doctor is Dr. James McDonald. Um, he did my last one that I had done, and he also did this one. So I was okay because I knew I would have my same doctor. I'm glad I did it. And I notice even now I can tie my own shoes now that I couldn't reach down and do certain things. I could do so many more things than I could do before. And the pain is not, not too bad now. I'm gonna feel much better. They're very caring and they know what they're doing. You just feel good when you, when you wake up, you know you're being taken care of. They come in, they try to do as much as they possibly can for you. Anything you get done from them, you know it's gonna be done well. And it is. I wouldn't have gone to any other hospital with this one. One of the interesting things is that there's a lot of um, advertisements for hospitals around. You see a lot of things uh, publicized about different programs. I will tell you, and this is out of an element of, of somewhat jealousy, to be honest with you, there is a spectacular joint program at this hospital, and it sets the standard, really, for those all across the country. And you're going to be lucky tonight to meet a number of people who are involved in that program, the first of which is uh, Dr. Paul King, who is the director of the joint program, I'd like to introduce him now. This is going to be one of those shows that I just sit and listen with you guys and learn. Yeah, we're going to so, learn a lot Dr. together. Dr. Paul King. Thank you. Thank you. So here's where I get to go on vacation and start listening to you. Yeah, look, see, he's very happy to be here. Which yes, is, yes, yes, like. very, very happy to be so, here. So, uh, how many of these people are actually your patients? <laughs> yeah, that's right, I don't know. Wave your hands if you're my patient. Huh? Yeah, yeah. Do you get to charge for a visit if they're here? <laughs> uh, just appreciate seeing familiar faces in the audience. That's right. All right, well, why don't you give uh, those that aren't your patients kind of a basic overview of the conditions you typically see on a daily basis? Uh, well, the, the orthopedic program here is fantastic. We have specialists in all areas, hands and sports and shoulders. Uh, my practice uh, involves uh, predominantly problems of the hip and knee. Uh, so I see young athletes with uh, ligament tears or more mature athletes with meniscal tears uh, or uh, a lot of people with arthritis of the hip and knee. That's essentially 95% of my practice now. 
And as you mentioned, the center here is great, and our center is actually the busiest hip and knee center in the state of uh, Maryland. The busiest. The busiest, yeah, in the state of Maryland. So, uh, even ahead of Hopkins? Oh, probably uh, twice as many as Hopkins. Wow. Uh, How many of you actually in the audience knew I that? I know that. That come as a surprise to you? Yeah, so, so last year, for example, we did uh, over 1,600 joint replacements, which was the busiest in the state. And that's pretty much, you know, one or two every year for the past many years. Uh, so it's a, it's a very busy place. So my, my life has become less about hands and feet and more about hips and knees uh, the longer I've been here. So I think, um, I think all of us would agree in medicine and somewhat a struggle for patients because I think they see that. But I think focusing in on specific areas actually makes a big difference. And when you're doing a specific area time and time again, you actually get really, really good at it. So the folks that see you, I think probably the biggest driver uh, is pain. Correct. And, and yes. I think that's what drives a lot of your activity. Is the pain different or uh, in character, whether it's young people that you're seeing or old people? Does it matter? Uh, There's no old people here, so no. it won't matter for this group. <laughs> Well, the the uh, the arthritis is an uh, an equal opportunity uh, employer. Discriminator. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Exactly. So, uh, you know, the young athlete who has a meniscus tear and a ligament injury has a different type of pain. But the people who have arthritis and they can be 30 or they can be 90. I mean, we see people of all ages with the arthritis. The pain is similar in many cases. Is there some uh, category that's at more risk for uh, hip pain? Well, no one, unfortunately, has uh, spared the risk of either hip or knee arthritis. And sometimes it's related to an injury, you know, from early in life. A sports injury in college may uh, lead to arthritis, you know, when you're 60. Mm -hmm. uh, some people have inflammatory arthritis, like rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, and there are uh, actually 100 other types of inflammatory arthritis, which may cause arthritis. Uh, osteoarthritis, by far the most common, is generally considered to be a wear and tear arthritis. So it could be pre previous injury, it could be a genetic predisposition, an active lifestyle. Uh, uh, people uh, who exercise less or people who weigh more may be at more risk for arthritis as well. Well, I, I know in your practice you focus on a lot of different areas in orthopedics, and so tonight we were hoping just to cover and do a few questions on the hip, and then we'll move to the knee, if that's okay. Yeah, that's fine. The hip's one of my favorite. Yeah, one of my Ooh. favorite subjects. Are you trying to tell me something? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, I could, yeah, I could talk for hours about the hip and bore everyone here, and they would all leave. And well, we'll we'll start with you. Must be a lot of fun at yeah, cocktail. That's, that's right. You guys hey, can invite you? me anytime. Would you like to hear I'm about here. the hip? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you get a chance here to educate our our guests. So go right in. Okay, great. I appreciate it. Uh, I think we have a video. Do we have yeah a video oh, of, a, of how a hip works, which might be a good uh, a good way to start. So this is a. Uh, a 3D animation of a normal hip. And so when we talk about the hip, uh, you know, from a, uh, my point or from an orthopedic surgeon's point of view, from hip arthritis, we're talking about the ball and socket joint. Uh, and so the normal ball and socket joint, uh, you know, very smooth, well-functioning, allows you to tie your shoes and put on your socks and, and walk and get in and out of a car without difficulty. Now this picture here, the on the left, uh, the artist's rendition of a normal hip, and the white color there is cartilage. Uh, which on the left side is normal. On the right side, you see the artist has drawn some holes in the cartilage or divots in the cartilage and redness indicative of inflammation. And that's what a hip would look like with arthritis, osteoarthritis. Uh, the red inflammation could be rheumatoid arthritis. But in that situation, that hip will have less motion and also pain with motion mm -hmm. uh, because the cartilage is not intact. Mm -hmm. How many people in the audience have been stunned as they get older, how much farther away their feet actually become from their body. <laughs> kind or of amazing, how long it takes to get there. It's a long <laughs> way down there all of a sudden. And those grandkids said, come on, Grandma just got down on the floor and let's play. That's not such an easy thing to do, is it? Or even on the dance floor, right? That's right. <laughs> Yeah, so that's one of the first things we see with hip arthritis is uh, pain, but also loss of range of motion. So dancing, tying your shoes, and then even walking may become affected. Uh, so you know, hip, uh, hip arthritis is a very, very common uh, disease, and we always try conservative therapy first to, to get it better. And we have a number of conservative options. And then, of course, we, we have hip replacement when those options are gone. You mean as an orthopedic surgeon, you don't go right to hip replacement? <laughs> 
you know, we actually spend almost uh, uh, much more of our time trying conservative therapy. Uh, we try medications and physical therapy, exercise programs. Sometimes we hmm. even do uh, x-ray guided cortisone injections to help provide relief. Uh, and uh, those are all uh, helpful, uh, but if those uh, uh, techniques or attempts fail, uh, then, then that's when we have to start thinking about surgery. And hip replacement, as, as you said, hip replacement is very successful, one of the more successful surgeries in modern medicine, uh, and also very prevalent, 260,000 in the country in 2008, and, and as the population ages and people are more active, that number is actually expected to double by about 2026. That's amazing. And so really just exponential increase in the amount, number of people who need a hip replacement. Well, let me ask you a question, because our primary focus here is always prevention. So you talked a little bit about conservative therapy. Can you speak about oh, how sure. we can prevent? Well, first, conservative someone? therapy is always our first, uh, our first attempt. Uh, basics, like you probably talk about it every doc's talk that you've had, healthy diet, you know, don't smoke. Yeah. We don't have uh, any smokers yeah. in the audience, because <laughs> no the doc's talk yeah. guys all quit. Oh, I'll say not to. Um, so, you know, healthy diet, don't smoke. Uh, frequent low impact exercise, uh, keep your muscles strong, ma maintain your ideal body weight, uh, and all this helps to you know, relieve the stress on your joints. Um, then there are more advanced options when those don't work. We have prescription anti-inflammatory medications, mm -hmm. uh, the cortisone injections, physical therapy, uh, supervised programs, uh, aqua therapy, and uh, water, super water type supervised exercise mm -hmm. programs, which may help strengthen the muscles. And uh, all of these things may provide temporary relief and sometimes prevent or delay the need for even consideration of surgery. That's good. So when you say to, to the group here, and I get asked this all the time, low impact exercise. Yes. What does that mean to this group? Are mm -hmm. they going to get out and jog? Are they going to get on elliptical? When, when you have someone comes in and say, you know, my hip hurts, mm -hmm. how am I supposed to exercise? They get in this cycle, their weight goes up because their hip hurts and they can't exercise and you want them to lose weight and exercise. What's your recommendations to get them out right. to, to change this? Right. Well, that's a, that's a great question. And first, a good concept about you know, our vascular surgeon, or, you know, all these different specialists we have here. Um, you know, as the hip or the knee gets arthritic and people don't exercise, their blood pressure goes up, their weight goes up, their cholesterol goes up. So first, I just want to say we look at this from a very comprehensive approach because it's more than just about the hip. You know, we have cardiologists who send us patients who need to do their cardiac rehab but can't because of the mm -hmm. hip. So it really has far-reaching implications. But in terms of the low-impact exercise, we really uh, customize it based on the patient. So someone who has more severe arthritis may be more limited in what they can do. But in general, the lower-impact activities, riding a bike, swimming, uh, exercises in the pool or an elliptical machine, for example, are generally considered preferable to jogging, for example. Okay. So I see a lot of uh, my patients that come in as I review their medication list, and I see this uh, chondroitin sulfate mm -hmm. as one of the medicines they're yes. on, and glucosamine, yes. like the old C and C combination. Yes. My mother used to have C and C, and it was a different kind of C and C that she used to have. I see, I hear a few <laughs> chuckles in the audience. There's a few C and C drinkers out here, I see. Yeah. So a little bit different, the C&C &C here. Yes, a little bit different. Yeah, my grandmother had the, the, the other C&C. And, the other C &C and I will tell you, my mother swore by it. Loosened up her joints. She could do a lot of different things. That's yes, right. Yes, yes. Yeah, my mother was horrified when my grandmother, this is my father's mother, tried to give it to me when I was 12. Oh, <laughs> yeah. And uh, that caused a little family tension. But yeah, the glucosamine and chondroitin, a different medication, nutritional supplement. Uh, and truthfully, when the NIH does a big study and a meta-analysis on it, the literature to support it is not rock solid. It's not clearly in the literature shown to work. But enough patients have told myself and my colleagues that it works that we usually recommend that people try it. Of all the nutritional supplements you hear about, MSM and shark cartilage and all sorts of things like that, and I don't, you know, if they don't hurt you, I think it's okay to try them, but the glucosamine and chondroitin is the one that really has the most uh, experience or people using it, and it does seem to help some people. And so I tell my patients, although uh, I don't know if it works and the literature is not totally conclusive, I actually take a pill every day. Now wait, I, I want to know, did everybody hear that? Do you all hear him, yeah. what he said? Yeah. You didn't hear him? Yeah. You can't hear. You can't hear, I'll speak. Why aren't you hear. throwing a brick at me <laughs> and saying, hey, I can't hear? Well, I'm the only one that you really need to hear. <laughs> All the rest of these, no, just kidding. All right, we'll speak up louder I'll, so I'll, you can I'll, hear. I'll speak up louder. So what he said was he made a true confession that although there's not a whole lot of literature out there, 
I take it every day. And uh, I, uh, uh, there, there are no- Louder, numbers. tell him, Louder. get it to him. I, I, can you, can you, okay, great, 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 great. Now the people up front have to cover their ears because I'm talking <laughs> so loud that they're gonna get a headache. Uh, the, um, I take it every day and uh, there's no literature to support it, but it has very few side effects. You should always check with your doctor before you start something like that. But uh, if it has no side effects other than it costs a little bit of money and it might help, uh, you know, so we recommend that people try it in many cases. Do you, do you want to get up in front and demonstrate how your hips work so we can see how well that track works? <laughs> how loose they kidding. are. Yeah. All right, so, you know, there are a lot of conservative things out there, but, you know, certainly I see a whole lot of patients in my practice that, that, that can't get along and I'm wondering what to do. How do I tell them, and they ask me, should I get my hip done? Yeah. How do they know when the bell has rung and it's time for me to get my hip replacement? Yeah, that's a, it's a fantastic question. I've got two now. I want you guys keeping score of how many good questions I've yes, asked. Yes, yes. Uh, it's a fantastic question. Uh, and there's not a simple answer because the answer is actually different for everybody. You know, I, we've had people have their hips replaced because they're playing in a senior tennis league and they can no longer play tennis. And we've had people who just want to be able to walk from their living room to their kitchen to have dinner. So it's highly variable. Yeah, highly variable. Everybody has a different threshold. Uh, I think it's a decision between the the patient, the person with the arthritis, and the orthopedic surgeon, and really, you know, 80% or 90% of that is the patient. Mm -hmm. So I think it's always try conservative therapy first. If the conservative therapy doesn't work, you think about surgery, and it's a very personalized uh, decision. It's interesting. That, that answer is not all that different um, than when I talk to patients, actually, about vascular surgery and their legs. And I, and I think we put it in a lot of different ways, but, you know, when all of a sudden you start adjusting life because of your condition, that maybe it's time really to think about addressing the condition. Yeah. Well, I think quality of life issues are really important. Yeah, that's exactly right. That's exactly right. And again, they're different for everybody, but no, right. no one person's issue is less important than another. Absolutely. And everyone comes to the decision in their own time and in their own way. Uh, but I think it's important, though, for people who, in whom conservative therapy has failed, uh, that you, you know, be educated, that you make yourself aware of the options. And I, I feel bad, actually, we'll see people who are in a wheelchair who have substantially curtailed their life for an extended period of time. Mm. I have surgery, actually, on someone like that uh, tomorrow, actually. I don't see him in the audience. But um, uh, we talked about this in the office. You know, they, uh, you just, it just, it's harder to recover once you're that far yes. disabled and you're out of shape and you've gained weight and you're in a wheelchair and you haven't walked in months or years. Uh, so it's important at least to educate yourself about the options uh, and not, you know, be afraid or, you know, make sure you have the information so that you can make an educated decision. Well, I mean, that's, that's why we're here tonight. We want to educate everyone to say, when is the appropriate time? But is there a particular age that someone should be when they decide to have a hip replacement? Yeah. And, that, and that's also a very good question. The uh, hip replacements were traditionally reserved for people who were over 60, mm -hmm. uh, but has uh, advances in technology, advances in material, advances in surgical technique, uh, have uh, been developed and as people are very active and, and uh, want to stay active later in life, we're finding that younger and younger people are considering the surgery uh, mm -hmm. and benefiting from the surgery. Uh, and so, uh, you know, we want to try the conservative therapy first and we don't want people very young to have the surgery, but when all other measures have failed, there's really no minimum age or maximum age. It really depends again on each individual person and uh, the decision that they've made. So you have a specific approach to hip replacements. Will you tell us a little bit more about it? Sure, sure. Well, the, uh, I've been doing uh, since 2010 now here at the hospital what's called a direct anterior approach to hip replacement, which is done on a special table, uh, allows us to put the hip in very exact positions with x-ray guidance uh, so that we can uh, perform the hip replacement through a technique that doesn't involve cutting mm -hmm. any muscle. Uh, now, I should say, like, I, I've done almost a thousand hip replacements through uh, a not direct anterior approach sure. technique. And there's nothing the matter with that technique. That technique works. So that technique is more lateral, correct? More lateral or posterior. Lateral or posterior, usually posterior. And, I, and again, we've done uh, almost a thousand hip replacements through that technique. That technique is, is fine and does a great job. Um, but we have, again, with this newer technology since the middle of 2010 with the table, um, using this muscle sparing approach where we don't have to cut muscle. Uh, I, I personally, in my practice, do 
almost all of the hip replacements except for uh, extremely complicated cases that way uh, because I think for most people I think in my practice are doing better. Most people I think aren't going to really understand this so you had a video for us to watch I think yes. for this approach yes, yes, so yes, yes. everybody pay attention to the screen again. Yeah so Joe, uh, Joe, the heels. Yep, Joe average patient high heels um, and we always take the jeans off before we do surgery. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, so the, the schematic here, the cartoon, uh, shows the muscle on the side of the hip, the tensor fascia lata, uh, and next to that, uh, the sartorius and rectus muscle. And with this, uh, you, it's very difficult to do this without the special table, but with the special table, you're able to position the leg so that you can slide between those muscles. And, and what did I just get out of that? Um, uh, not much, yeah. Here's a little more, here's okay. a little more detail. There we go. So this is a little more gory. So you're not cutting through the muscle, not cutting through separating. the muscle, we're moving them aside. And then th this shows that as we move those muscles aside, we can get down to the hip. That's now a this, good if video. You, this if is you good. have a sensitive stomach, you look away now, but we actually, you know, incise the hip capsule to enter the hip. This technique was actually traditionally used to expose the hip in babies and children who had infection because of its less invasive approach. And then with the special table, we were able to manipulate the leg to do the hip replacement. But uh, so the, the hip is exposed and then the arthritic ball is removed. Uh, and uh, you know, with the, with the saw, yes, we do have to use a saw. Uh, and the arthritic ball is removed and that allows us access to put the hip replacement in. The hip replacement essentially replaces the ball in socket. So there's a titanium device that goes up into the pelvis, which recreates the socket, uh, and then a stem that goes down into the femur, on top of which we put a, a artificial head. Uh, and those will, and, and there's the socket there. And you can see using the special table not shown, but the special table moves the leg so that we can access the socket, remove the arthritic bone, uh, so that we can put the artificial socket in. And that's mm -hmm. the artificial socket. Uh, and the artificial socket has a titanium coating on it that bone grows into, and then it has a liner that goes in, that's a polyethylene liner. Uh, and then on the femur, you know, the thigh bone, uh, we're able again to work between the muscles to access the femur with the assistance of the table uh, to insert, again, a usually a titanium hip replacement that the bone grows into. And then on top of that, uh, we'll put an artificial ball and articulate it back together. So what you have is an artificial ball on an artificial socket. There are no nerves and therefore no pain. Mm -hmm. uh, and, be, and you know the muscles fall back into their normal position. Uh, and so that's going uh, down into the femur. Down into the femur, right. And that's a titanium coated device that the bone will grow into. Uh, a neck goes on top of that, which re represents or recreates the neck of the native hip. And then on top of that goes a ball. This video makes it. Look How long all does very this surgery take? Simple and easy. It takes. What do you mean it takes? It takes five yeah, minutes. Yeah, it takes five minutes. Yeah, <laughs> we do. We do forty a day, and um, no, and then uh, no, it, t it takes about ninety minutes. Okay. Uh, ninety minutes to two hours, uh, and then uh, the once the artificial ball is put on top, we're able to relocate the hip, and. Again, with the use of the special table, the hip is rotated back into position. And with this technique, um, we're actually, uh, uh, you know, having people, you know, with hip replacement in general, we're having people walk very quickly. So a patient might have that done in the morning and walk by the afternoon. That's wow. almost, that's hard to believe. I mean, that's, that's a huge part, I'm sure, of why you select this technique. But are there other evidence-based reasons why you say, I want to do I think, this. I, I think they're all stunned. <laughs> yeah. yeah. All right, come on yeah. back. Come on it's back. okay. Yeah. So really, I want to go back to that. When we have people walk hundreds of feet in the afternoon after the surgery, that, that quick walking, you know, decreases the risk of blood clots, decreases the risk of complications, encourages the muscles to improve. Does it increase the risk of pain? <laughs> That's a great question. Um, the, uh, you know, the, the pain, um, one of the big things uh, that we can talk about is the, the pain management techniques we use, which have advanced okay. dramatically. But one of the, one of the things, uh, again, uh, I've done a lot of hip replacements the other way. I've now mm -hmm. done a lot of hip replacements this way. They're both great. With the newer approach, you know, and when I, when I studied it, and we have ongoing studies looking at how people are doing, you know, we're seeing almost 70% uh, of the people going home in two days or less from the hospital. They're able to walk the same day in almost all cases. 
Uh, we're at, we've actually eliminated the use of intravenous morphine after the surgery in almost all cases, so they can take just That's pills. Huge. Uh, so, and in it, eliminating the morphine has led to less nausea, less vomiting, less confusion. Uh, so, uh, the other benefit of the surgery with the table is that we're able to, uh, because the person's on their back, as a traditional hip replacement, you're usually laying on your side. Uh, when you're on your back, we actually use an x-ray machine while we're doing the surgery, which guides the placement of the components. And that really uh, helps improve the accuracy of the placement of the components. So it's a little more customized. Well, the image guide, it really helps you know before you're done that everything is really where you want it mm. to be and the leg is the length that you want it to be, all these type of things. So he's giving out free coupons right now for yeah. an image for, for the, the five-minute version. Like all right, so video, right? we've, we've gone a little bit, but I want to get to one other thing because we, we love controversy here mm -hmm. because it gets people's attention. There's been a lot of stuff recently in the press and... I saw the my, my good friend Peter Angelos is yes. always on this, and yes. there's been a lot of stuff about the varying <laughs> surfaces yes. of hips. And so tell us about what, the, what right. that's all about, just in case these guys see a commercial. Sure, yeah, I mean, if you, if you have a TV, you're gonna see a commercial, I mean, mm -hmm. it's, it's everywhere. Uh, and this is the source, uh, the subject, rather, of ongoing research. Um, essentially, researchers, engineers, uh, hip replacement companies, hip replacement surgeons are, are constantly trying to uh, Improve, uh, improve hip replacements to improve longevity. So the whole issue with hip replacement is you want it to last as long as possible. Mm -hmm. So newer bearing surfaces are constantly being developed and evaluated, uh, and those include cross-link polyethylene, metal-on-metal metal hip replacements, and ceramic-on-ceramic ceramic hip replacements. Now the hard-on-hard hard bearings, metal-on-metal metal hip replacements, uh, have in the lab at least showed excellent reduction in wear, which should improve longevity, which, which would theoretically help those younger patients. Now, unfortunately, one of those devices, uh, which was used predominantly in Australia and Europe, but also in this country, um, had a higher than expected failure rate when evaluated in the Australian hip registry data. Hmm. Uh, and so it was withdrawn from the market, and then the failure rate unfortunately continued to increase, and then it was actually recalled by the FDA. Okay. So this was one device, it was a metal on metal device, uh, but that has led to a great deal of research about the family of metal on metal hip replacements. And some of those uh, hip replacements, because of this increased research, uh, Patients have been found who have actually had reactions to the metal, mm -hmm. uh, allergic reactions, which has caused tissue damage. So the bottom line is uh, it doesn't affect everybody. It only affects a small percentage. We're not sure who it affects and who it doesn't affect. Uh, but at the institution now, we've eliminated the use of any of those devices until more research really shows us. Okay, so these guys don't have to run out and call them. Yeah, that's right. That's okay, right. so one other quick one because I know we've got another expert back there and he's going to be really mad if you stole all his time. <laughs> Why don't you give our audience a, a quick thing about your new pain management perioperatively because I think a lot of us actually really want to learn from that. And I think it's something really important for people to understand what's really different and evolving here at this institution. Well, regardless of the, uh, the approach, the less invasive approaches which decrease pain, we have, it's not really a new thing, it's really almost an ongoing thing where we constantly on a monthly basis or a bi-monthly basis have multidisciplinary meetings with the Joint Center where we evaluate the pain management techniques. Hmm. So we work very closely with our anesthesia team and a lot of what we're doing, which we've led particularly with the hip replacement is give people medications actually before they have surgery. They get to the hospital and we give them a cup of pills to take, which preemptively helps prevent pain. And uh, by doing that and by using special anesthetic techniques, nerve blocks, spinal anesthetics, local injections of anesthesia, uh, we're seeing people have less pain, less need for the morphine postoperatively, and more ability to walk, for walk example, the first day, like on the said. day of surgery. Yeah, mm -hmm. and that leads to people leaving the hospital sooner, getting back with their family, you know, getting back to work. And the whole thing just kind of flows back to work quicker, get rid of the cane quicker. Uh, and so it all really starts actually uh, before the surgery. We do physical therapy before the surgery. All these things, you know, lead to try and, you know, speed the rate of recovery. Well, let me ask you quickly about, because I know we want to bring out Jim, what are the best recovery processes for patients after they've gone through the initial surgery? Yeah, you know, I think the surgery is very important. I, I should just mention that. And big studies have shown that hospitals that do more surgery, surgeons that do more surgery, have better outcomes yes. than smaller centers around the country. So uh, I think that's an important concept. And then here at the Joint Center, uh, so my, my other job is working with the director of the Joint Center, and we spend a lot of time 
working on the exercise-based protocol, physical therapy-based protocol, and consultation with our outpatient physical therapists to really, mm -hmm. and, the, and the exercise in the end before and after surgery, I think, is really the key to a uh, successful recovery. Absolutely. So why don't we get out uh, your partner in crime, uh, since uh, we also have two knees, <laughs> and he's going to be very upset if you monopolize his time. So without further ado, I'd like to bring out uh, Dr. McDonald to talk to us about knees. Absolutely. Hello. You see. Thanks, John. He, he took all your time. He I know, sure did. Exactly. You, you covered everything. We're, we're good. So, Jim, you guys both focus on hip and knees, right? That's correct. But can you talk specifically to the knee tonight? Certainly, certainly. Uh, the way they train orthopedic surgeons in the United States, uh, a lot of us do fellowships, which are advanced training. And the fellowship trained doctor that you're going to look for to do your hip or knee replacement um, is somebody that has this advanced training. It's an extra year. And um, you mentioned us doing both of them. Uh, we both did a fellowship that covers both hip and knee replacement, and that's essentially called an adult reconstruction fellowship. So, oh. yeah, but, but for tonight, I'm the knee guy. Okay. <laughs> All right. So, th talk to us a little bit about knee function and. Yeah, I mean, w when you look at sort of the impact of knee or hip arthritis on, on patients in general, there's sort of, I see that in sort of two ways. I mean, there's the, the impact that uh, it has on individual patients and also the impact on society. So each individual patient, if they have arthritis, is going to have a lot of pain. It's going to um, mess up their activities of daily living. And a lot of the topics you already discussed, not being able to walk, decreased mobility, and then all the health problems that come after that. Um, the societal implications are also huge, though, because it, this um, will affect a person's ability to work, um, their uh, ability to work on their job, and that can be a, a huge problem um, for, for, the, for the world. Um, in and I've heard that it even increases the rates of depression and anxiety. Uh, absolutely. I mean, these patients, I mean, some of them come in and, you know, uh, Dr. King was talking about a patient who was in a wheelchair. I mean, that person is depressed. I mean, they're, they're unable to perform the activities that they want to do, and that's just because they've got a bad joint. Um, in 2008, I think we both used the same year, actually, for some reason, 2008. But in 2008, there were 600,000 uh, knee replacements done. So actually, when you look year to year, there are more knee replacements done than hip. And when you look at those graphs looking forward into the future, it is, it's almost exponential, the number of joint replacements that are going to have to be done um, over the next 10 or 20 years. It's amazing. Does that mean the knee wears out before the hip? Is that why you're doing more? Are you more important than Paul? <laughs> you said it. You said it, Dr. Long. Um, I like controversy. It's so much more fun. There are more knees out there. I essentially yeah, yeah two hips and two knees. It's the same right. number. Right? I understand. I got it. I got it. I realize it. you're an orthopedic surgeon. But it's the same number, really. The math. The math is difficult. I understand. Um, <clears throat> <laughs> there, the knee joint is a joint that just tends to wear out uh, sooner and faster and more often in human beings. I think it has to do with the fact that you've got a relatively small joint that's stuck between these two long lever arms, and it's it's a bad design. Uh, it's just a bad design. And Should I, I wasn't get on the phone with God today. right now? God, are you listening? <laughs> I think in this show, we can just ask you, John. <laughs> Whoa, I'm not going that far. Either that or I'm upgrading my contract. There you go. The <laughs> but um, the, uh, so, so the knee can wear out. There are more knee replacements done than hips. Uh, I think that when you look at what causes knee arthritis, in addition to having uh, predisposition of getting arthritis from just having bad cartilage. In addition, if you have any injuries around your knee, that can cause more arthritis. So if you have a soft tissue injury inside the knee or um, a fracture around the knee, uh, that can uh, predispose you to getting knee arthritis. So I think that whole combination of things uh, would... Um, well, they're vulnerable. They're vulnerable joints. They are. So why don't you, and uh, Paul showed us how the hip works. You want to show us how the knee works? Yes, and I think we have a, I think we have a video. So flashy animation, the bottom bone is your tibia, that's your shin bone. Top bone is your femur, which is your thigh bone. The other word for patella is kneecap. And the cartilage is the soft tissue structure that we were talking about earlier um, between the, the bones. 
and that's that soft tissue cushion that's so important. Now, what they didn't show in the animation, obviously, is that that's a hinge joint, then the, fle and the femur and the tibia can bend. This slide shows disease progression, and when you're looking at the slide to your left, uh, that's essentially a normal knee where you have a good cartilage cushion between the bones, same concept as the hip. And as the slides move to your right, you can see that the knee is becoming more and more arthritic. And finally, that, that last slide shows a, a completely worn down knee, and that's a bone-on-bone -on -bone, uh, knee that is in need of uh, my services. That's a pretty telling slide. Yeah. That's pretty impressive, actually, when you look at it. Part so of the reason I like my job, and I'll say this to patients a lot in the clinic, part of the reason I like my job is it's fairly uh, easy to figure out who um, would benefit from my services. <laughs> so that goes along with the counting. Right, exactly. <laughs> so is, is it the x-ray, actually, that dictates that you need your knee done, or is it the symptoms? Is that the, is the picture say, OK, you no. need it, or is it, it something different? It really always comes down to the patient's symptoms. The, we're not treating the x-rays, and I'll say this to patients again in the clinic, an epithet that I always use is that the patients uh, are the ones that decide when they need a knee replacement. Uh, we're not operating on an x-ray, we're operating on, on a patient, and ultimately we need, to have, we need to have a happy patient at the end of it. So you go through the same series of conservative steps. When the patient comes in, they have a, they have a sore knee. Um, we're going to try to maximize conservative management, which is the same thing as you went through with Paul and the hip. You're going to get them involved in physical therapy to strengthen the muscles around the joint. Um, you want to advise them on use of anti-inflammatory medicines and pain medicines. Um, in the knee, uh, we can actually do uh, two types of injections um, in the knee uh, in the office, and I have a lot of patients that come in for cortisone injections, uh, which is anti-inflammatory. Uh, the uh, cortisone, I, and an, I sort of built an analogy with patients, and I'll say that a cortisone injection in the knee is sort of like taking 20 Motrin tablets and putting in the knee all at once. <laughs> so those are pretty effective. And also there's another um, category of injection that we can use in the knee. It's called a joint lubricant injection. And this works to make the synovial fluid inside your knee joint healthier so it'll act as a better cushion. Uh, again, these are things that we do routinely in the office. So. I think it's important that the patients know that if they come to the office, it's not like we're just going to sign them up for a joint replacement. I mean, most, as Paul said, most of the time we spend in the office is trying to help them avoid surgery or help them feel better with the joints that they have. I have a question, though. So just going back to weight and prevention, is there something we can do, or is, it, is there an impact on the knee? Is yeah, that's, uh, that's a huge issue, and again, we talk about it all the time in clinic. For every... Uh, pound of body weight that you have, um, that places three pounds of force on your hip or your knee. So if you're heavy, you're putting uh, more weight on the joints, which predisposes you to get arthritis and also predisposes you to have more pain. A lot of the patients that I see in the office that have an x-ray like that one on the right, where they have a horrible knee, but they're not having that many symptoms, those patients tend to be really wiry and very muscular. Um, however, if they're heavy, then they're putting more pressure on the knee, and that's going to cause more pain. Does now, it reverse? Yeah, well, exactly. On the, on the flip side, I can also encourage heavy patients and say, hey, for every pound that you lose, that's three pounds of force you're taking off that joint. So that can be motivating in the clinic, and um, this is a lot of the counseling that I do every day. So like Paul, he was talking about sort of the best exercises to do in order to maximize. Right. Is there one for the knee? I mean, I can imagine imagine jogging is not necessarily that's right. I mean, similar rules apply. I mean, when right. you don't really want it, jogging is great exercise, but it's really hard on your hip or your knee. Mm -hmm. So we usually recommend low impact exercises, swimming, biking, walking, hiking, you know, things that you discussed before. Um, also, specifically for the knee, oftentimes, and I don't know if we have any uh, ladies that go to curves here, but oftentimes, and I know one of the stations at curves involves putting a weight around your ankle and extending your knee and then flexing it and extending it. Well, that particular exercise for knee can be very harmful to the joint. It can really hurt. And what one of the small tricks that they'll teach you in physical therapy is that if you want to strengthen this quadricep muscle, extending the joint may hurt you. But if you just make your knee straight and lift it up and down this way, you'll still strengthen your quadricep muscle without tearing up your knee joint. That's good. So when you talked about conservative therapy and injections, and I'm sure that's where you start, how do you decide which of those two injections you use, whether you do 
the cortisone or the synovial fluid? How do you decide yeah, which that's, of those two? Again, every, every day. Uh, usually I start with a cortisone injection just because it's, it's one shot and it is something that honestly gives patients pretty quick relief. It usually takes like a couple days for the cortisone injection to kick in and they're, they're happy they came to see me because two days later their knee feels better. Um, How long does it last? Variable. Uh, it, it really depends on You don't give a guarantee number. for that one? I do not give a guarantee. <laughs> um, we, it will last differently for every patient. And what we usually say is you can do the injection once every th three or four months, um, and we hope that it'll last that long. How many people in the audience have actually had an injection in their knee? Wow. Now that's a lot. That's a lot. I'm glad I, I'm, I'm glad I brought some business cards. <laughs> Holy smokes. Okay, let me ask you another question. How many of you in the audience had the injection work? Nobody's hand went up. <laughs> What's that all about? None of these are my patients. <laughs> you all must have gone somewhere else for your I'm glad you came tonight because you'll get better injections here. All right, so you go through the conservative treatment, and I guess at some point you decide the next step. And I guess that, as you said, that's different for everyone? For everyone it's different, and really you only decide on surgery when conservative management fails. And failure means usually one month, three months, six months, 12 months, what's the typical? Again, different for everyone. I mean, I've had patients come into the office that had essentially already failed conservative management, but hadn't formally been through the process. If somebody has a horrible x-ray and they've been miserable for six months, then that's somebody that I'm going to discuss conservative management with. But if they're ready to go, I, I don't put a time limit on that. I mean, that person, if they're ready to go and I think that they're ready for surgery, then we move forward. So surgery. Tell us a little bit about surgery here for the knee. Is it, is it as cool as Paul's surgery or is yours not as cool? It's far cooler because there's three <laughs> bones involved. <laughs> another, another number, three. Three. Uh, but yeah. All right. <laughs> so, um, Knee replacement, total knee replacement is a little bit of a misnomer. I think people come in and they think that we're gonna make some big incision or cut in the, in the middle of their thigh and make another one in the middle of their shin and somehow we're gonna transpose some huge hinge uh, between, their, between their femur and their tibia. And that's not really what happens. Uh, essentially what we're doing is we're removing the arthritic surfaces off the end of the femur and the top of the tibia and replacing those surfaces with metal and polyethylene. So um, patient, patients are sometimes reassured uh, when they hear that. Um, and the third bone is the patella that they showed on the screen. And that is that the patella can become arthritic and well as well. And that is resurfaced along with the other two. So I saw some stuff recently that they got this really cool now 3D custom thing. So you can now come in with your custom knee instead of these trays 10 miles long and you have to figure out which one. You can actually plan better ahead of time. Right. Tell us a little bit about that. This is a, this is a new process that I've, I've been involved in, and I'm actually very interested in this. Uh, this involves having a three-dimensional picture taken of the knee before the surgery. Uh, we do this with an MRI scanner. And we send those images down to the implant manufacturer, and the engineers will create a 3D model of your knee in the computer, and they can essentially do the operation on the computer before we bring it to the operating room. Mm -hmm. And I can also look at those pictures and provide input. And I think that it's nice because it really gives me a chance to do the operation twice. I, I do it once on the computer beforehand, then we bring these custom cutting jigs from the manufacturer to the operating room, and we can really create a custom fit knee, which I think is going to uh, improve our results. Uh, I say that, but I, I, I say it with some hesitancy because you have to realize that for decades we've been doing the operation with standard jigs, and those standard jigs have worked very, very well. So I think jigs. that this uh, jigs meaning um, not all of jigs. us got the lingo here. <laughs> We're not all cutting. Cutting jigs are the um, we usually use metal blocks that have slots in them, and those are the slots through which we cut the bone with the saw. Now the standard cutting jigs are um, during the procedure, you sort of do a measure twice and cut once sort of thing where the, you place the jig on the bone and you make the resection. Okay, Jim, I need to see this. This is hard to understand. Is that right? Okay, yeah. well, it's time to go to the video. Perfect segue. Okay. Um, now, this is a knee replacement. Uh, the femoral component is on the top, and that's like a cap that goes on the end of the bone. 
and the tibial piece is that flat metal piece with, the, with that short spike on the bottom, and you're seeing it bend, and then they uh, put, the, put the bones around it. The white piece in between was the polyethylene that I was speaking of. So that's, is this uh, more costly for the patient to have it done this way? No. And there's another video. Oh, this is the, uh, this is the custom cutting jig uh, video where um, that white thing that's going on the tibia right there was made by the engineer at the implant company and that resection was planned on the computer before the procedure and then we bring those to the operating room and put the knee in place. So it's like batting practice. You get to take a few practice swings first. Before exactly, really exactly. <laughs> and you can play with it on the computer. It's, it's, uh, so this was the week of American Idol and we had the voice where there was a winner at the end and so before we move on, who has the cooler operation? All right. Is it the knee? Everybody raise your hand. How many knees? Not a lot of knees. Oh, is it no, the come, hip? Come on. Oh, hip wins. Uh, hip wins. Uh, hip is more hip. You get the recording contract. Don't get up there and sing your finale, please. I had a question about osteoarthritis versus osteoporosis, because I think a lot of times patients come to us and are confused about what is the difference between the two. That's a great question. Osteoporosis is the actual weakening of the bone and this can cause fractures of your hip or fractures in your lumbar spine. So if your bone is becoming weaker, you can get fractures. This is different from osteoarthritis. Osteoarthritis is actually a wearing down process of the joints themselves, and arthritis doesn't really predispose you to get fractures the way osteoporosis does. And you won't get osteoporosis in your knee. <laughs> it's uncommon, right. uncommon. So recovery after this, is it as quick uh, as he described? Because his patients are up walking the next day and then they're running a marathon two know, days I know, later. I know. <laughs> so how about yours? This is where, this is where I, I do have to say that um, worldwide, regardless of hip approach or knee approach, I do think that the hips do recover a little bit quicker. Um, there's something about a hip where you put that new socket and that new ball in place, it almost gives the patients their motion right away. And when you take away that arthritis, they, they do feel, they feel better uh, pretty quick. With knees, um, it takes a little bit more work. The therapy is a little bit tougher. Uh, I think it has to do with the fact with the knee, you're actually replacing the end of the femur with a circular object and the top of the tibia with a flat one. And for the person to actually move their knee, they have to engage their muscle. So muscle strength and uh, that sort of activity is more important uh, post-operatively after a knee, whereas hips, sense. I think, do a little bit quicker. So I, I will tell you, we're, we're getting toward the end here, and, and before we close, I do want to congratulate both of you, and, and I, I see Dr. Faust and Dr. Massard, at least, and then Dr. Zinniak in the audience. For those of you that haven't been through it, and I think there's probably a fair number who've been through the joint camp, it really is a spectacular thing here. And, and it was actually, this has been one of the premier places in the country that actually do this. And, and something that you gentlemen, all of you, should be accredited for. I think most of us have done our best to try to copy what you've done up there. And, and if, if in fact you ever need a joint done, this is actually the place to get it done. So I, I want to thank both of you for your uh, efforts tonight. You've been good sports about all this. And I know okay. you're going to hang around for questions afterwards. But thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, B, it's been fun. We had a good time tonight. Right. How about you guys? You have One a good time? time? It's good. I think we all learned a great deal. We try to end these shows every time with what our, our three key takeaways are. So I will, in great fashion, well, I, ladies first. I'm ready for this one because, right. you know, I've been speaking to women tonight, and I think the key is we can't just sit around and stay in pain. There are right surgeries for the right problem, and there you've got to be able to pull the trigger. And personally, if I had to pick, I picked the hip if I had a problem. Well, then I have to be different. You know, my three big ones tonight are uh, actually, I actually didn't know all of the conservative things that were done. And quite frankly, with all the orthopedic surgeons around here, I thought you came in and everybody got a joint replacement. So I, I'm impressed actually with the number of conservative things that can be done. That's actually a very big thing for me. I think the second thing actually has absolutely nothing to do with tonight, I hate to say this, it's been my experience at this institution with the joint surgeons here. This is an amazing group of people who actually are an inspiration to the rest of us at this institution in what they do. Absolutely. And so I think for me that's been a big part of learning this. And I think the final thing for me is an encouragement to all of you, you don't need to suffer. 
I mean, I, th these guys, you go walk through one time up on the joint floor, you're stunned at how quickly everyone's better. And so I would encourage all of you that if you're on that edge, and I, I certainly see a fair number of people on that edge, take that step. I think you'll see it as a life-changing event uh, for the better. So fantastic things. Yes. So tonight, we still have more to come. So I want to remind everybody to stick around. We have the Meet the Expert session, and you can talk to Dr. King, Dr. McDonald, and we have two others, too, right? Yep, Dr. Wazniak and Dr. Sanjeev are going to be talking about exercise therapy, so you're going to pick the right room. Mm -hmm. And the ushers in the back of the room will actually get you to the right place. And I will tell you, throughout the, the last year we've had these programs, these question and answer sessions have actually been fantastic and, and a highlight of the program. It's probably the best part of what we do. I, I really think it's been fantastic.